Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's guest is an award-winning actor who's brought us many memorable performances in numerous movies, including Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home, Shadows of Desire, Alien Nation, The Enemy Within, Seeds of Doubt, Blindness, Born Wild, The Untold Story, and his latest film, Night Train, directed by the amazing Shane Stanley, who recently appeared on our show. You've also seen him in dozens of TV shows, including One Life to Live, Higher Ground, Wildfire, The Secret Circle, The Bay, and The Bold and the Beautiful. But he's perhaps best remembered for playing Byron Sully, the love interest and husband of Jane Seymour's character on the hugely popular hit TV show, Dr. Quinn, Medicine Woman. He reprised his role as Sully in Dr. Quinn, Medicine Woman, the movie, and Dr. Quinn, Medicine Woman, The Heart Within, as well as in the hilarious comedy short, Dr. Quinn, Morphine Woman. And those of us who couldn't get enough of the on-screen chemistry between our guest and the wonderful Jane Seymour got to see them together again in Perfectly Prudence, Friendsgiving, and A Christmas Spark. In 1993, he was included in People Magazine's list of the 50 most beautiful people in the world, but he's so much more than that. Besides being a great actor, he's a highly skilled chef, an avid cyclist, and a very devoted family man. I'm delighted to welcome Joe Lando to our show. Joe, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. That was wonderful. I appreciate being here on this very cold and wet day here in Los Angeles. Joe, you've had such an interesting career, starting with soap operas. You've appeared in a number of them, including One Life to Live, Guiding Light, and most recently, The Bold and the Beautiful. I've heard it said that working on a soap opera is the toughest work in the business for an actor. Do you agree? It definitely is. I mean, I, I've done a lot of different things as an actor, but working on a soap is, it's so grinding. You have to do so much work every day. And now... It's different than when I was on One Life to Live and Guiding Light. You shoot, you should shoot just one show a day when I was on One Life to Live. And that was plenty. He'd have like 20, 30 pages. But now they shoot multiple shows. Like in The Bold and the Beautiful, they'll shoot three shows, four shows or something a day. And it's incredible. These poor actors, you know, they have to study 50 pages of dialogue, 40 pages. And that's incredible. But yeah, it's the toughest job out there. Where As opposed to that, I'm Dr. Quinn. We were doing... Nine pages was a big day. You know, there was a lot more action and stuff, but, you know, soaps is, is way tougher than anybody can appreciate unless you're there doing it. Now, when I was doing my research about Dr. Quinn, Medicine Woman, I believe I read that you were cast in the show even before Jane Seymour. Is that right? That is correct. I... I was still finishing up my stay on One Life to Live. They had had me back to do this, this storyline where Jessica Tuck was leaving. And I was under contract with CBS for a pilot development deal. And they send you three scripts and you can deny all three and then you have to give back some of the money. <laughs> or you take one of them, which obviously you do. And the first one they sent me was Dr. Quinn. And it was a Western and no one was doing Westerns. I had just seen The Unforgiven and and Dances with Wolves in the past the few years before that. So that was still fresh in my mind. And I was just praying that, you know, people would want to see a Western again. And I always wanted to be a mountain man. And so I asked if that would be okay. And they were like, well, that's who we were thinking, you know, you could play in this thing. That'd be fantastic. And I picked that. And well, they're like, that's great, but we have to wait and see, you know, how this develops. If, if we find a Dr. Quinn and all the stars align and they did. And yeah, I didn't find out until I came to the set. I was in New York. I flew back, finished up my storyline and in, uh, on one life to live, came back and, and came to meet Jane on the set in Pasadena where they were shooting, uh, the Boston scenes for the pilot. And there she was, Jane Seymour. You know, so take us back to the night you were watching the pilot for Dr. Quinn, Medicine Woman, not knowing whether it was going to be picked up by the network. Did you have any confidence that the show would become a hit? Honestly, I don't know. I was so, so nervous. I know where I was. 
because it was on January 1st. So we celebrated the night before whether or not it was going to become a hit or be picked up or anything. We just, you know, I was happy for what had gone down, the experience. And I was in Arizona with my wife, who's not my wife, but at the time she wasn't, and my best friends. And we put on tuxedos and I had rented a room in a nice hotel. <laughs> and uh, we... We lived large. We had champagne and, you know, and acted like big shots that night. And then the next day, we, my wife and I stayed in the room, ordered dinner, sat there, you know, in front of the TV, eating our room service, watching the show. And I just going, I was like, is that, is that good? Did we, was that okay? Did, you know, because my wife hadn't seen it yet. And then all the calls came in from all my friends and my family, and they all loved it. And, you know, you can't tell by that. <laughs> you know, they say, oh, wow, that was terrible. You really stunk it up, Joe. But no, uh, then the next day we left and we drove towards California and cell phones weren't a big deal then yet. So a lot of people weren't calling me and I really didn't have a connection where I was up in the mountains. We rented a cabin. I didn't want to come back to town. I was really scared to find out the news. I was sitting in the cabin and my wife knew that I was a nervous wreck and she said, why don't you just go make the call? And so I went down the street to a phone booth. I called back to LA to find out and heard that they had gotten like, we tied for number six with the sugar bowl on on January 1st. And that was like, you know, 30 million people or something ridiculous like that. So that was the start, man. And then everything was, it was just like a rocket ship after that. Well, I'm sure you would agree with me, Joe, that the on-screen chemistry between you and Jane Seymour was, and still is, pure magic. And as you know, it doesn't always happen. Even if the actors have a close personal relationship, it sometimes doesn't show on screen. Is there a way for you to make that happen? No. I mean, I've heard other performers say the same thing. It's there or it isn't if you force it. You know, you've seen people try to force chemistry before and it just... It just doesn't work. And I don't know. I've, I've had that experience with a few actors and Jane is like the number one. We just click. It just, you know, it just works. I don't know why, you know, but it does. And thankfully it worked so well. We didn't have to force anything. And and like you saw in the Christmas spark, this last thing we did together, that was just a hoot. We had a good time. I was envious when she got the job because I read the script and I thought this could be fun if the two of us did that. But I, I thought they were going to hire a Canadian actor and that I, I wasn't even in the running. But, you know, a, a couple weeks later, they called me up and asked me if I wanted to do it. And I was like, let me think about it. Okay. <laughs> well, it's well known that you did many of your own stunts on Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman, even really dangerous ones like running on top of a moving train. Does doing your own stunts make the character you're playing feel more real to you? Everything that you can do as an actor, in my opinion, that the character is doing makes it more real for you. Running on top of a train was just like a childhood fantasy that I wanted to do. And when I'm reading the script and, you know, the the screen direction says, and Selby jumps up on top of the train and runs across and then jumps in and kicks the conductor. I was like... I don't know if they're going to let me do that, but I'm sure he's going to ask for it, you know? And that was just so cool. The train wasn't going really fast, but the reality is I was up on a train running on top of it as it was driving down the tracks. And there wasn't like there were pads for me to fall on. And then swinging in and hitting the guy. That was, that was really cool. Now, many people say that you should never work with animals or children, but you did both on Dr. Quinn medicine woman, the animals, the horses, that beautiful dog, Wolf. There were deer. There was a bald eagle, a rattlesnake. There was even a grizzly bear, if I remember right. Was there anything that you ever refused to do on that show? No, I even ate live worms in one episode where Sully falls off a cliff at the end. It was a a real cliffhanger. I literally fell off the cliff and (gasps) is he alive? And he comes back next season and I'm busted up and I've crawled into this cave and I'm, you know, trying to stay alive. And and there was a scene where I reach up into a nest and I find some robin eggs and I chow down those and then into some wood to get some grubs. And and so I really did it. I was like, I got to give this a shot because, you know, God bless the prop guys, but they put some gummy bears in there <laughs> and they took their grubby little hands and they tried to form them into worms. And I'm like, well, now I'm not eating those for sure. You know, <laughs> I'm going to eat the real worms and give that a shot. So yeah, 
I, there's, I don't know. I never came across something that I wouldn't do. I, I designed a stunt when I was on higher ground. I copied a stunt that I, I saw many years before performed by uh, the great Dar Robinson, where he does this high fall off of a building. And I just redid it, but I only fell four stories into a bunch of boxes with the green screen over it. And on higher ground, I did that four times in a row. And I think the only way I got away with it was because I was one of the producers on the show. And they must not have been very pleased with me. <laughs> no, it was like, sure, yeah, you want to do that? And and we built the scaffolding and all the guys, you know, built the boxes. We tied them together, threw the screen on there. And I went up and I fell off four times. And I knew on the fourth time that was like, and now I'm done. I can't, I'm not doing it anymore because I started going further over. But it's the scariest thing you let go. And it's only a matter of like two seconds, three seconds maybe before you hit. But in your mind, it felt like I was on 15 seconds, you know, and I'm thinking, oh, I, I missed the boxes. I, I'm going to hit the ground. And then boom, the bear, the bear was scary. The bear was a scary thing because that's that was uh, twice I've worked with a bear, once on higher ground and then on Dr. Quinn. And that bear smelled and he was big. And he's the largest working mammal, I think, <laughs> on television or in the movies. And one day when we were doing it, they first had the carpenters build the wall. I've told the story before, but they, they had the carpenters go and build the wall and have the bear come in and practice pushing on this wall that I'm supposed to be on the other side of, right? And at one point, he puts his paw through the wall. And you see this bear paw come in. Rah. Well, they built it when they thought for sure that this is going to stand no problem. The bear came up and practiced first push. Boom. Went down. That bear is like 900 pounds, 1,000 pounds. So they reinforced it a whole bunch more, really made sure, because I would have been like a pancake on that other side of that had it fallen on me. And when they came to do the stunt that day, the bear is terrific. I was right there. He pushed the board through that he was supposed to. You just see this paw come in. They add the growls later on because if a bear makes noise, a bear's not happy, I was told. So they're always pretty quiet when, they, when you see them growling and open their mouth on the set. And just They're like lip syncing, you know? And so later on that day, that bear's supposed to run through the door because I open it. And then we take off, but the bear, the back wall was open so the bear could run all the way through and, and go out to the trainer. But the bear ran all the way through, kept going, missed the trainer, and kept just running. And the stunt woman who was playing Jane, that lady, she flew. <laughs> she was running so fast. One of the rangers, the park rangers, climbed a tree to hide from the bear. And, and you know, the, they got control of the bear pretty quickly right away. The trainers yelled and, and threw some chicken to him. And, you know, the bear just thought he was doing what he was supposed to do. But I have that on video, actually, someplace in my archives because I was right behind the real camera. And we have this white wire around us that the bear has been trained that it's supposed to be electrocuted and if it touch it, touches it. But the whole time you're thinking it's just a little wire. How's that bear going to stop? But yeah, he avoided that in the camera and just chased the stunt woman into the parking lot. That was a scary one, but fun. That's really fascinating. When you think, when we watch that episode, we have no idea what was going on. I really hope that one day you post that video on social media. It'll go viral. Yeah, I have to look for that one. The snake one, the rattlesnake, was no big deal because there was a piece of plexiglass between me and the snake. I don't even think he could pick up my heat, you know, correctly through that. So they were like, you know, waving things in front of him, getting to kind of get his tongue out and want to look like he was going to strike. But that was, that was nothing, you know. Easy for you to say. Did you base your portrayal of Byron Sully on anyone that you know? Or were you channeling anyone? I was very into the doors at the time. And so he was Jim Morrison as a as a mountain man in my mind in the beginnings. In fact, in the pilot, after I get in a fight in the bar and I walk out and Dr. Mike, you know, escapes in a wagon with the kids or something, I kind of I'm left walking down the street and it finishes on me. And I just totally did a Jim Morrison, <laughs> this kind of saunter. If you look back at old posters of him, it's the same haircut. You know, it was like a, a regular haircut starting to grow out, you know. And so that's what mine was. When I was on the soaps, I had kind of a, a shaggy haircut for a soap. And, and then it just started growing out when I knew I was going to be Sully. And I wanted to look like Jim Morrison and Jeremiah Johnson kind of put together because I love that movie with Robert Redford. 
That was one of my favorites as a as a young man, as a kid. Yeah, so those were, you know, the kind of hippie man vibe. Yeah, very much so. I was wondering, is there any aspect of Sully that reflects the real Joe Lando? Yeah, we're a lot alike in our just kind of sensibility. He's not a he's not a, a complicated man, and nor am I, but I do believe uh one of the things that I liked about him and I and I, I appreciate about myself is that we're both very loyal dogs, so to speak, just like his wolf and, and he was loyal to he was loyal to his friends and his family and, and and Native Americans who were his family, you know, they adopted him, saved his life, and he always stood by them. I think those are similar attributes. And also, you know, I'll protect the ones I love. And I knew that it was true about Sully. Have any of the characters you've played over the years come close to resembling the real you? Bits of Sully and I think Jake Harrison, you know, on One Life to Live was probably closest to me because I was, that's the youngest I was as an actor. And at the time, you know, you only have a limited amount to draw from in your life. And I, and I was scared as hell <laughs> and trying my best. So, you know, I went to whatever was easy, probably just being me, you know, I made sure I wore cowboy boots like I did for no p particular reason, because I lived in New York City <laughs> and wouldn't let them do my hair up or, or make me too, too, done looking you know i wanted so i mean uh jake to be a little rough around the edges and and i think that was really close to to who i was then and different different now you know your characters get a little richer and change when you can do that and you know i'm always trying to be better never never achieved what i really wanted but i'm you know still working on it oh you're getting there <laughs> Thank you. When I mentioned Dr. Quinn, morphine woman, in my intro, you chuckled. How did that come about? Jane had an idea about that. They, I think, they, oh, I know how, they approached her about making a Dr. Quinn. And, and she said, kind of let me think about it. And she was a fan of Breaking Bad, as, as I was, everybody. And and she kind of came up with the outline of it. And then they wrote a script, kind of, you know, just suggestions, more or less situations that we were going to do. Because it's funny or die, you know, and it's, it's improv mostly. And so we just showed up on the set and just about everybody came. And it was what a riot we had, you know, all getting together. We were at the ranch for the last time because then it tragically burnt down. But to be together with all those people... We're not getting paid. We're just there for the fun of it. And we laughed. I mean, I was, I had tears in my eyes during some of the stuff. They're all knocking on the door. I was off camera watching it and everyone's just ad-libbing and saying this. <laughs> and Grace is willing to give her baby. And <laughs> oh man, it killed me. And, and they, they put this wig on, you know, I got there in the morning and they put a wig and I had a really big head. And so they, they didn't judge right on the size of the wig when they put it on. They had it right here to my hairline, kind of like this hat is on right now. And as the day went by, I was waiting to shoot because we were doing other things. And the wig just kept sliding back further and further. And before we shot, they were going to like fix this. No, no, no. This is even funnier, don't you think? <laughs> it doesn't fit. <laughs> and and I, every time I see that, I just crack up. I mean, Jane's so good in it. And and. It's a funny, funny thing. If no one else has seen it, and if people haven't seen it, you got to go to Funny and Die and check out Morphine Woman. It's oh, great. it's absolutely hilarious. I remember very distinctly after Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman was over, I wondered if you ever felt unfairly typecast or pigeonholed as an actor because you were so prominently identified with the Sully character. Yes, and when I used to have hiatus from Dr. Quinn, I, I always worked, you know, I appreciated the fact that I was on the train and I was moving forward literally with my career and I never wanted to take a moment to stop. So I would on our hiatus, which was usually like eight weeks, maybe I would do a movie of the week, which took up sometimes four or six weeks and then do a little independent film, which was usually two or three weeks or whatever. And then a couple of days off and then boom, right back to Dr. Quinn. When I would have those times off, it was always difficult for even CBS, who I worked for, to put me in a movie of the week because it kind of had to fit the character. 
or whatever. So I was able to make it work several different times with the long hair. But a lot of times I'd be like, you know, it's just so identifiable. You look like that. And it's tough to put you in something to get people to think of you as Sully. So I listened to that for almost seven years, right? Show gets canceled too soon, in my opinion. You know, we still had some stories to tell and we could have finished it up a lot better, but we too soon. And I cut my hair off and went to this famous, you know, guy who cuts people's hair in Beverly Hills and had this haircut done. And I was like, wow, uh, this is totally different. Started going around auditioning again. They're like, where's your hair? Oh, and then they weren't so excited to hire me with my short hair. I was like, wow, we can't win. But eventually people stopped thinking about that and let me, you know, try a different look and a different me. Because that was my plan always. If you spend this much time in a series, if I grew my hair, cut my hair short, I'd see, I'd watched other actors do it. Mel Gibson did it, you know, grew his hair long, cut it short, started short. So I, that's what I was trying to do because there's not a lot of different looks I can have, you know. Well, besides Dr. Quinn, my favorite TV show of yours so far is Higher Ground. You play the headmaster at a very special therapeutic residential school for troubled adolescents. And the show dealt with many serious issues like substance abuse, gang violence, eating disorders, learning disabilities, even suicide. You were the executive producer of that show and it got great reviews. Why wasn't it renewed after the first season? Thank you for, for that. It was a it was one of the best experiences of my life working on that show. Being a producer is, is tough. I tried to be as involved as I could be. A lot of times it's just a vanity title. It was it was a tough job being the producer. And like I, you know, said it, it sometimes is just a vanity title, but I didn't want that. I wanted really to be part of it. And so proud of it. We we cast a bunch of really young good actors. They were all basically the people they were playing. We had great stories, good writers. Michael Braverman was one of the producers, Matt Hastings and Doug Schwartz. It was an interesting combo of people, but we really loved what we were doing. Thought we had a good message in the show. Would have been picked up had the, the network that it was on not been sold. And then that got lost in the shuffle. And, you know, it was tragic, really, because I, I really liked it. And it hurt. It really hurt when the thing went down. But I'm very proud of what we did. And the letters that I would get, the fan letters and, and the rest of the cast, it would, they'd be so moving. And after so many years of being told, oh, you have pretty hair and la la la, and you know, this and that to be told, you know, you saved my life and you made a difference. And, and literally, I, mean, I, I still have a box full of those letters in my office and safe. And, and I keep them in every, you know, five, six years, I read them and I feel good again about a lot of things and, and about the fact that, you know, we're not just entertaining people and, and, and you know, we're doing a lot more sometimes. And that's, that was great. great. Well, you are very justifiably proud of what you achieved on that show, Joe, in terms of socially significant programming that actually had a therapeutic component to it. One of the things I really loved about the show was the famous quotes that started each episode from people like Shakespeare, Oscar Wilde, Mary Shelley, and even Elvis Costello. That yeah. was a brilliant concept, don't you think? Yeah, and someone brought that up, and I was like, I love that idea. I mean, we tried it, and it was just like, I go, got to do this every time. I argued about the music and lost out on some of those things, <laughs> but I... I really fought for that one and, and it worked out great. I thought it was really well done. We would try our best to 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 really work hard on the music. It, it, it's an expensive thing, but once in a while we were able to buy a song in the arms of a stranger. Uh, we had one of the episodes by Sarah McLaughlin and I think she only okayed it because she lived down the street from us and went over there and personally asked her and, and she, she owned the song. So yes, we were able to afford that one and it was just perfect. Yes. Well, my favorite quote from Higher Ground, which really touched me profoundly, was from Eleanor Roosevelt, who said, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. That quote really had a life altering impact on me. And I'm so glad I get to thank you publicly for the role you played in bringing that series to the world. Wow. Um, 
That's wonderful. Thank you for, for sharing that with me. I mean, we don't get to hear this kind of stuff. And the fact that that made a difference to you, honestly, is just, it's, wow, it's quite an honor. You know, look how cool this job is. <laughs> One of the breakout stars from Higher Ground was a very young Hayden Christensen. You could really see his potential back then, couldn't you? Yeah, and I was just telling someone the other day, the two people that auditioned for that that I remember because they were tapes that came from Toronto, I believe, was was Hayden Christensen and another guy named Ryan Gosling. I don't know what happened to Gosling. <laughs> but <laughs> you could tell Hayden was, I mean, Ryan was very TV savvy. He did a great audition. Hayden really, really embodied that, that moody kid that, you know, not that he was like that in real life. It just, he just did it so well. And yeah, Hayden, AJ Cook, Megan Laurie, Jewel State. God, there was just so many people. Everybody, everybody went on and had a, a good career. And uh, proud of that too, you know, in order to see somebody when they're so young. And that was the first and only time I've been involved in casting something, you know. And so it was, and it was nerve wracking too, because you know what they're going through. You know, I've been there a thousand times. Well, That's you that. knocked it out of the park in the casting of that show. Would you ever want to do another long-running TV series? Oh, I, I would love to. Seeing things like Yellowstone, of course, or anything, you know, anything like that would just be wonderful. But, you know, we'll see. Shane and I have something hopefully coming up this year that we'll be working on. So I'm looking forward to that. My buddy Shane Stanley, uh, he and I wrote a, a little uh, action script and... Looks like looks like it's sold, so we'll see. I mean, you line a whole bunch of stuff up, Harvey, and most of it falls away, and every once in a while something, you know, remains standing, and, and you just try your best to support that and, and move on and, and then do the next one. Well, I'm it's so glad you mentioned Shane Stanley. Yeah. He facilitated this interview. He's a very dear mutual friend of ours. You've worked with Shane a number of times in movies like Paloma's Flight, the Untold Story, and the latest one, Night Train. What makes him such a special director? He knows when to when you need help, and he knows when to just let you run. That's a good thing, and he's so bright. I mean, he knows basically where he's cutting it, how it, it, it I just love working with him. And he's, he's like every man on the, on the, and every woman, every person on the set, he's equal, even though he's the boss, he doesn't, he doesn't act like that unless, you know, he needs to straighten all the kids out. <laughs> Sometimes a crew can get like a bag of cats, you know, and, and, and Shane controls all that. He does a wonderful job and, and he gets great performances out of actors and he gets so much production value for the dollar. I mean, He's, he's a really, really talented guy, and I'm very proud to have him as a friend. And, and for him to introduce me to you, now I have another friend. You sure do. I'm, I just adore Shane. The role you play in Night Train as the father is a bit of a departure from anything that I've ever seen you do. And when Shane was on our show, he said that your character was modeled after Hal Needham, the stuntman. Were you channeling him during that performance? Well, I, I've i seen Hal Needham many times when I was a young man. I first came to town because I wanted to be a stuntman because I thought being a stuntman would lead for me to be an actor. So I was very into the whole stuntman life and, and Hal Needham was like God. And he was, he was a character, you know? He wore tight pants and a big belt buckle and kind of flashy glasses. That's why I have those kind of flashy glasses that I bought at Kmart like the night before we shot those scenes or at Walmart, I should say. And I had known a lot of guys like this over the years on Dr. Quinn, especially because I was working with some OG stuntmen from, you know, the old Westerns who were just kind of finishing up their careers when they were on Dr. Quinn and, and saw the pain that they worked through, you know, the, they sacrificed their bodies for a job that at the end of the day, you know, no one really remembers you and, and, it's kind of a thankless thing. And, you know, I saw guys fall off horse, break their arm, get back on the horse and do the stunt three more times. It was incredible. And then there's painkillers and there's things that people take to keep going. And and I looked at my character in Night Train as 
that guy, you know, all those a combination of Hal Needham's, you know, bravado and then all the pain and, and everything that these guys would carry on their backs. And this man now I felt very close to because at the time when Shane called me up to do this, I'd pretty much stopped acting. Acting Prior to the pandemic, really, it, it wasn't for me anymore than, than the pandemic hit. And just, I was like, Phew. I now I don't feel guilty. I don't feel like I have to be doing this. There's no this to do, you know, and that eliminated the pressure unbeknownst to me. The pandemic kind of took the pressure off of me to have to think about, oh, I don't want to do this. I don't want to tell anybody I don't want to do this anymore. I couldn't do it. So it kind of took the pressure off and time went by and, you know, over almost two years of not working. Shane gave me a call and said, do you want to do this? And I read it and it was a small part. And I'm like, yeah, there's no heavy lifting here. And I kind of like the guy, I know how I need him. But it really, I just said yes before I really started to think about it. And then I started getting frightened. You know, like, oh, I, I, back in the thing, I don't know if I want to do this. And the more I read the script, the more I started to see inside this guy. And I was like, I, yeah, I'm, I'm into this. I, I want to really do, I understand who he is. There's a lot of me in, in that character. Um, I'm very surprised to hear you say that prior to the pandemic, you were thinking of, of giving up acting. Because when I look at your work in Night Train, mm -hmm. I think it's a real showcase for a more gruff screen persona. It shows a different side of your acting. And I think it could open some very interesting new doors for you. So I, I'm really glad you did not give it up. Well, thank you. And so am I, you know, and whatever comes will come. And I, I just was so happy. And, and the scene that I have with my daughter in the junkyard, it just clicked when I was walking to the set. It was just like all of a sudden, just everything was real. I used a nine iron as a as a walking stick for my character, which was my father's nine iron. And as I walked there with it, I, I started feeling like, all the pain and everything that I didn't really have, but just all the pain that this guy had. And it just was just perfect. It just, you know, that, that magical little thing that happens sometimes when you're an actor, it's just a click and, and you're that guy. And I knew I was that guy for that day, you know, and it really felt good. And then I was hooked. It's like, damn, he did it to me. <laughs> now he's got me hooked and I'm back in it. And, you know, and then uh, I worked on a couple of soaps in between. And then Christmas Spark was a totally different, you know, with Jane, a totally different kind of person and character. Again, a lot like me, that guy is. I mean, I like to goof around. I like to have fun. It was the lighter side of Joe and, and uh, Night Train was the darker side. I'm uh, really, really glad that your destiny has gone in this direction because I think you're about to see a whole lot of different kind of portrayals that you'll be doing that completely separate you from your previous work on TV, but give you this whole new career as a character actor with a history. You know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. layered and it's complex. And that's what we saw in Night Train. And it was very refreshing. I think maybe that introspection during the pandemic has done something to your your perspective as an actor in who you really want to portray yourself to be now it did and you know it's growing up too it's you get to a certain age and it took me a long time boy i'm slow to mature sometimes but when it finally i had time to be very introspective just by myself and and think about me and, and life and all of a sudden you're like okay I'm happy where I am I'm happy who I am I'm, I'm aware of the fact that we all get old and no matter what you do you can't stop it so you better embrace it you better take care of yourself and and love yourself and and you know what you are who you are and if people don't like it sorry <laughs> There's nothing not to like, Joe. You've worked with some other great directors like Matt Hastings, who directed you in Higher Ground, Bloodsuckers, and Engage to Kill, I think. Yeah. Do you have any desire to direct? 
You know, when I was on higher ground, that was my intention. I wanted to, in the second year, direct, you know, every fifth episode or every fourth episode. Something. I really did. I wanted to, and I enjoy it, but now I think I'd rather as an actor be able to come to the set, do my job, <laughs> and then go home and not have to sit with that baby for another year, you know, because sometimes that's how long something will take, you know, Shane, he just sweats from the moment he starts it, doing the pre-production all the way to post until it's released. He's he's there doing it. And it's it's really, and it's thankless and it's a lot of time. And so in answer to your question, I used to want to, but now I'm, I guess, I'm a little too lazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've mentioned the Christmas movies. You've made two terrific Christmas movies for the Lifetime Channel, A Very Charming Christmas Town, and your most recent one, A Christmas Spark, co-starring Jane Seymour, which was the most watched Christmas movie on TV last year. In case you didn't know, I found that out. Wow. Is there any no. truth to the rumor that there's going to be a sequel to A Christmas Spark? The truth is, Jane and I say, yeah, we're just waiting to hear from Lifetime the and or the fans. They should, you know talk to Lifetime about it because they're really the ones that, that drive the bus at the end of the day. And they pay attention to the fans and, and Jane has a huge fan base. And I know, I know people will come to the party if we do a second one. <laughs> and I know that Jane and I and Rhonda, our director, our great director, all are, are up for it. So I would love to be able to go back up to Vancouver next year, you know, or this year, I should say and do a sequel with the, with the cast that we worked with. I had a great time and, and see, you know, something more of those two Hank and Molly characters because they were fun and I could see doing more than one or two or three. <laughs> okay, so everyone watching, you know what you need to do. We've got to send a deluge of requests to Lifetime. Now, Joe, I know you're a very humble guy, but I assume you know that you also, it's not just Jane, you have an amazingly large and extremely loyal fan base worldwide. They follow everything you do and they maintain social media sites dedicated to you and your work. That must be so gratifying. Well, I didn't realize a lot of this, in all honesty, Harvey, I'm not lying because I've been not involved in social media it was jane talking to me literally every day up in vancouver you've got to take a picture for the instagram you got to do this i was like i know no 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 we get in arguments about it she's like you got it and everybody else is like yeah i'm getting this girl it's fun and i said i've never done it okay all right and then i started like one day in my trailer it's like okay i'm gonna do this to start she's like have your kids help me it's like i'm gonna try to do it myself and and I've learned so much, you know, and it's like, I'm really enjoying Instagram, not posting things, but reading stuff that other people write. And, and I found more, I'm not looking for celebrities and things they do on Instagram. I'm looking for kind of the spiritual messages that I find there, which I've never been that guy before, you know, but enjoying that aspect of it and, and loving that Jane turned me on to social media and hopefully I mean, now I go out there and I see there's oh, the idea that there's a, a Facebook page that I didn't have anything to do with that had like 158,000 followers on. I uh, I have to figure out how to do a decent Facebook page and, and I guess, you know, have people from there follow me too. And I'll, I, I don't know how to interact. With it. I know I don't mean to sound like such a, a guy out of Kate, but I, I don't know much about this stuff, you know. You've got kids. They'll show you. Yeah. Kids are like Facebook. Dad, who does Facebook? <laughs> you know, it's not Snapchat and Instagram. I'm like, I'm, I'm happy with the Insta. You know, <laughs> I like that. And uh, yeah. And so I'm, I'm honored. I am blessed to have these fans that have stuck by my side. And yeah, they're just wonderful and supportive and and, you know, really make this this old guy feel good sometimes. Well, you know, Joe, I love that you say that because you've had a long career. Your success certainly didn't come overnight. You struggled in the beginning working as a cook in a restaurant until you could make a living as an actor. Do you have any advice for any young aspiring actors out there who might be watching this interview? Well, I think a lot of people are uh, misinformed by what they see today, that people can just easily become 
you know, mega stars. Yes, yeah, some do, but the amount of people that fall by the wayside, guys, you know, becoming an internet sensation is one thing, but working as an actor from where I come from, it's hard work. You put in your time, you, you just, you know, you do what you have to do. Well, I worked in restaurants. I catered motion pictures. That was satisfying because I was not only cooking, which I like to do, not to that extent, but it's hard work. But I also was on set. So I got to see actors and work with people at a different level, but observe them working and, and learned from that. It's very important to understand that from, from my perspective and people my age who are in the business, we worked really hard and, you know, it, it was 10 years of hard work to get your lucky break. And then it's not overnight and sometimes it doesn't last forever. So for young actors, study, put in the time, don't make a fool of yourself. I studied for a year, almost two before I even went out on my first audition and still was terrible. You know, uh, my first audition was with uh, John Travolta. It was crazy. I couldn't believe that somehow I got ahead of the line and, and got an audition with John Travolta for a movie called Perfect with Jamie Lee Curtis. Oh, yeah. um, and didn't get the part. They offered me something like a Chippendales dancer part. And I was like, nah, nah, that's not really what I want to do. <laughs> I can't dance. But really worked hard, put in my time and you know, opportunities come up and you take advantage of them. I just have been very lucky and blessed and things just lined up, but I did stand around for 10 years waiting for it to happen, working and trying my best. And it was tough, but, you know, good things take time and and study your craft and and hopefully, you know, it'll work for you. It doesn't matter what you look like, you know. You used to have to be like a... a beautiful woman or a handsome man or you know people don't look at looks like that anymore you know it's not like oh he's movie star handsome it's like the, the, a movie star comes in all different kinds of shapes and sizes and colors and you know personalities people it's it's amazing this this acting world is so much bigger than it was earlier you know when i started well, one of the things about you that I think is so remarkable is that although you were very much perceived as a heartthrob and People Magazine said you were one of the 50 most beautiful people, you have never lived the so-called Hollywood lifestyle. You've been very happily married to your wife, Kirsten, for over 25 years. Everyone who knows you says that you have always put your family first. Where do you think that stability and that maturity comes from? Like I said, I matured slowly. I got married when I was 36. I had my son. So yeah, 36. I I knew by looking at other people, being an actor, you observe other people. And I couldn't help but observe my friends and people close to me who were working their tails off and missing the, their kids growing up. And I just spent all my time working on my career and dedicated myself to that, knowing that later on, I'm going to be able to have this family that I want so much. But right now, I won't be a good husband. I won't be a good father. I won't be a good anything unless I concentrate on what I have to do. And with that maturity, I walked into being a dad and had a very good dad. And grew up in a little town, Long Grove, surrounded by a lot of good dads and moms and good old Midwestern folks. So I learned from my family and I learned from a lot of the families around me how I wanted to be as a father. I didn't want to do it until I could really give it my best shot. And so I waited a long time. And with that came a little more maturity. That's all, you know. Well, Joe, you have a very down to earth modesty about yourself. I can sense the gratitude you feel about your life, which is so refreshing. I've so enjoyed this opportunity to chat with you. I hope you'll come back anytime you have a project you'd like to promote. You are always welcome on our show. Thank you so, so much for taking the time to appear on our show. Thank you so much, Harvey. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. You are a, a real honest to goodness person too, I can tell. And I appreciate you having me here. And I appreciate you folks. Please, uh, Hopefully everyone will tune in and uh, join me on Instagram and when I have a Facebook account <laughs> and I'll let you know next time when I'm going to appear with Harvey. So thank you, Harvey. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Joe. Our guest has been the wonderful Joe Lando. 
My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver, my amazing managers, Rick and Robin at the Marcelli Company in Hollywood, and my entire team at the XPTV1 network in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.